Good morning, C3 Cottonwood family. We're just so excited that you're joining us this morning. I'm Pastor Kathleen. And I am Pastor Frank, and we are delighted that you're with us this morning. You know, the Word of God says that this is the day that He has made, and we're supposed to rejoice and be glad in it. And so I'm going to ask you this morning, just allow yourself just to sit back and let's have a great time. Enjoy yourself in the presence of God. There's a great message that's coming forth. And I know this message is going to touch your heart, if not just set you free in other areas. God wants to do, God wants to work in our lives. And when he does, guess what? It just brings joy and peace to us. So this is the day for your deliverance. This is the day for what God wants in your life. This is the day that he answered your prayer. This is the day. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to ask for my beautiful wife just to open us up in prayer. And let's just go forth and see what God does for us this morning. Amen. Amen. Go Amen. ahead, sweetheart. So, Father God, we just mm. lift up all your sons and daughters that are yes, watching today. Yes. We ask that in the name of Jesus that your presence would be tangible. They could feel mm, it. They yes, could experience Father. it. They know it. Yes. That, Father God, you would grant them a spirit of wisdom, revelation, yes. and understanding of you. I pray, Father God, that you would let them know how much you love them because yes, of Father. how much you love Jesus. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're revealing this to everyone here. In Jesus' name, we bless our family. We yes. bless them with prosperity we bless them with knowledge we bless them and ask you to bless them that they will flourish in jesus name amen amen this is your day good morning c3 it is time for generosity you know many times i am asked why should we tithe what's the importance of tithing so let me just quickly give you three reasons why you and i should understand the importance of tithing in our lives number one it honors the lord in the book of proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 it says honor the lord with thy substance so when we uh, give of what we have what really what god's given us and we give back to him what we're doing is we're just honoring him for who he is in our lives, for what he's done in our lives and the things he's about to do in our lives. So when we tithe, it is honoring the Lord our God with our substance. Secondly, it's a reminder of your dependence upon God. See, we find ourselves day in and day out placing our dependence on different things so that we can get things done, so that we may succeed. Whatever the reason may be, we find ourselves placing our dependence upon on other things and what I want to say to you this morning that our dependence should always be on our Father in heaven and one way that we express this dependence is through our generosity when you and I tithe in Deuteronomy chapter 14 it says this learn to trust the Lord thy God always so in all things always in all things we are to trust him and one way we express our trust and our dependence is through our tithes and then the third one it enables those whom God has called to further the kingdom of God to build his church so we're talking about those that God has called within the church the fivefold ministry the missionaries whomever they may be that work for the Lord it allows us to go forth and further Further God's kingdom, build God's uh, uh, house. And so uh, the three things, again, real quick, is to honor the Lord. It's a reminder of our dependence upon Him, and it enables those who are called of God to further the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, from the Passion Translation, I think really speaks at this point so well, and is talking about generosity. Listen to this. It says, give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. Listen to this, your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. So your generosity is going to determine what comes back to you and so when we talk about 
uh, tithing and offering or the time within the service to take up our tithe and offering. In this church, we call it a time for generosity. So your generosity will determine the measure of your return. So real, just real simple. That's why it's important to understand tithing. That's why it's important to tithe. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you this morning that as we come together and, and we allow ourselves to listen to the Holy Spirit as he leads us in this time of generosity, I pray, Father God, that we will allow ourselves to be generous, Father God, even generous to a fault. I thank you that your word is very clear that as we are generous, generous gifts will come back to us. Our generosity and the amount of will become the measure of those that are generous back to us. So Father God, I just bless your people and I pray that they'll be generous in their giving this morning. I thank you, I bless you, and I give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' mighty way, mighty name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. God bless you and thank you for your obedience to the Word of God. Have a great day. Now, uh, Thelma and I have been going to the church for over a year now, actually. It's been about a year and a few months. And we love C3. We love the ministry of the Navarreses. I call him PFN, and I call her PK, and I call Juan PJ, and I call Evie PE. We've got a lot of pastors around here, but the message that they've all been delivering has been pretty much the same message, that when 2021 gets here, we're going to be entering into a new era, and there is going to be many, many challenges ahead, but God has got a plan where the disciples of God C3 are going to rise up and do our part in the great kingdom victory that is to come. And that means you and me. So how many of you are ready to move your level of discipleship up a notch or two between now and the, begin the rest of this year? Because today is the first Sunday of this year. Uh, we are going to sow the seed, the word of God in each heart here, and we're going to call upon you to rise up and to be a better version of a Christ follower than you've ever been. Who's in? Who wants that? Does anyone not want that? You know what? Everywhere I go, there's always a couple of people that will say, well, you know, this whole all-in stuff, this 100% for Jesus, you know, I'm willing to invest maybe 30%. Uh, you know, I'm not going to carry a cross for anybody. Uh, in fact, I believe in crossless Christianity. And when you look at America, there's just two kinds of Christians. There's either the all-ins or the semi-ins. You know what I'm saying? And we have a word for that kind of Christianity. It's not discipleship. It's theism. That person is a theist, meaning that they're good with God. They believe the Bible to a degree as long as it's not inconvenient. And they are ready to do whatever fits into their schedule on Thursdays between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. for God. Then the rest of the week, they do their own thing. And that kind of Christianity is not going to cut it in 2021 and beyond. Because I'm anticipating a decade of challenge, not just a year of challenge. It's going to take a new kind of disciple to handle what's coming down the pike. But God has his plan, and as we center ourselves in his plan, we have no reason to fear, as Proverbs 1.33 says. There's no reason to fear. Have you read the last page of the Bible? Guess what it says? We win. Say, we win. We win. We win. You're saying, well, there's not that many people here today. Well, don't despise small beginnings. It's the first Sunday of the year. By the last Sunday of the year, I'm sure it's going to be packed out. We're going to have... Something going on here that's going to help the whole, all the boats rise in Cottonwood. You know, I'm concerned about Cottonwood and the state of the church here. Uh, this is going to be a challenge for a lot of churches. C3 needs to be strong for the other churches. You understand me? We're in this together. And it's a life and death matter here in Cottonwood. So, are you up for adventure? You're up for something really cool, right? So that's what God is promising. 
Now, the idea here, the question is, do I want to be a more productive, more devoted, more uh, deeper in my faith as I enter into 2021? And you've already said yes. To ask any other question is ludicrous. I want to be a mighty dis the disciple for Jesus Christ. I want to be a fully devoted follower of the Son of God. And I want to tell you that when uh, Prophet Ed Trout was here in early December, he shared a message on the rich young ruler. You remember the rich young ruler had everything money could buy. He was set, but he lacked one thing, and he went to Jesus to see if he could get it. And Jesus said, do you obey the commandments? He says, I obey all the commandments. Do you pray? Yes, I pray. I do it all. He says, the one thing you lack is you're not following me. I'm going to put steps in front of you. If you follow those steps, you will have salvation. Otherwise, you're a theist. Okay? Now, theist is very close to atheist. You take the space out, you've got atheist. There's not that much difference. And it certainly isn't a world-class kind of Christianity which is needed today. Anybody tracking with me here? You're with me. Okay, well, Pastor Frank's with me, but I don't know about the guy in the back. Are you with me back there? Kelly, what do you think? You're, you're with me. All right. I just wanted to know. So the bottom line here in this introduction that I'm trying to get across to you is that there is a huge difference between atheist Christianity and fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. The fully voted, devoted follower is someone who takes up their cross and follows in the exact steps of Jesus Christ. That's what you and I are called to. Amen. Hey, Frank, thank you for that message. Good preaching. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you a little bit about my testimony here before I get too excited. When, uh, in 1972, Thelma and I married. In 1973, I became a believer. I was a rock star. I'm serious, I was a rock star, at least in my mind. Uh, in San Francisco, played with a great band. We played gigs all over the place. And uh, it was a very exciting life. And our roadie, the guy that handled the equipment became a Christian and invited us to church. This was the third time that I'd ever been in a church building in my life. I'm a young adult. Here I am in church. The preacher was preaching on the transfiguration. When he came to the part where God from the Shekinah cloud said to, to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I did. And in that moment, my life was turned 180 degrees. I turned to my wife at that very moment, and I said to you, I think I just became a Christian. And she went, uh, not you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so there I was in my beetle boots and my purple bell bottoms. And by the way, my hair, <laughs> you'll have to come by and see the pictures. I got some in my photo album. You know, I was a freak and I let my freak flag fly. And now I've become a Christian. And it was a, kind of a strange thing because the band was playing every Friday night, every Saturday night, hardly ever in San Francisco. We were always going north. We were two or three hours out of town. We'd do the gig in Fort Bragg or Ukiah. Uh, then we'd pack up our two and a half ton mail truck with all that big equipment that rock bands used to carry around. We'd drive into the Bay Area. The sun would be coming up. We'd uh, offload the equipment. And guess what I'd do? I'd go to church. Still reeking of the party. Okay? All kinds of various aromas coming off of my purple bell bottoms, if you know what I'm saying. And i walk into church and sit in the back, and of course nobody noticed me. This church was really odd. You see, it was part of uh, uh, the chaplain of the Concord Neighbor Weapons Station, which was supplying the ammunition for the Vietnam War. He was the chaplain of the Marines and the Navy. And here I show up. There used to be the, uh, the, the sergeants. There was three Marine sergeants that attended the church, and sometimes they'd wear their dress blues right there in the service. They freaked me out. <laughs> 
but they were the real deal. But they'd all done tours and seen combat. They were serious people, and they had loved Jesus. And now I was loving Jesus, and we were all together. But, you know, I was not quite where I should have been, honestly, because I remember somebody saw me playing uh, in the band at the, the, the college. Our local college was Diablo Valley College. Thelma and I were raised in Diablo Valley at the foot of Mount Diablo. That's where we were raised, but Jesus walked right into Diablo Valley and found me and pulled me out. So this guy comes up to me and says, hey, weren't you playing in that rock band? And I said, oh, that wasn't me. Because I hadn't grown enough in my faith not to tell a lie. <laughs> I mean, lying was the way I operated. But God began to work on my character. He began to work on my morality, my conscience. I didn't know I had one of those things. And that's where I started. All those years ago, almost 50 years ago, when I became a believer. And by the way, all my friends were going, you've become a Christian? You're a Jesus freak? Yeah, I'm a Jesus freak. What do you think about that, huh? I don't think they liked it so much. But I kept growing. I, I, I began to make some progress here and there. And so that's what I really want to talk to you about. I'm taking you to the parable of the sower. I'm going to read this passage to you. This is from Mark 4, starting with verse 3. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep root, it died. Other seed fell upon thorn and drew up thorns and drew, grew up and choked out the tender plants so they produced no no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, the good soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times. How much was that? 30, 60, and 100. Remember that. Then he said, anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen and understand. Now I'm going to skip ahead a few verses to 13, because Jesus explains, he gives the interpretation of what this parable meant. He says, then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand the other parables? The farmer planted seeds by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represented those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represented those who hear the message and immediately received it with joy. But since they didn't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns uh, represents others who heard the word of God, but all, all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and the desires for other things. So no fruit was produced. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of, say it with me, 30, 60, and 100 uh, fold times as much as has been planted. Let's pray. Father, will you illuminate our minds now with your word and show us the truth. And Lord, compel us and raise us up to be the disciples that you want us to be, fully devoted to the cause of Jesus Christ. In his precious name, the name of Jesus, the Son of God, amen. Amen. Now, how many soil conditions are taught in the parable of the soil? soil, soil? There's the hard soil, there's the shallow soil, there's the weed-infested soil, and there's the good soil. And that's the way it's been taught in the church for centuries. You pick up any commentary on Mark, Matthew, or Luke and look up the sower, you're going to find that they say there are four conditions of soil here. And I taught that and preached many messages in my 35 years as a preacher, uh, messages on the parable of the sower, confirming that there are four conditions of soil. But last year, I saw something new in the parable of the sower something that I'd never heard anybody teach 
in the church in all my years of wandering around Christendom in America had never heard anybody teach a six-condition soil. Yeah, there's six conditions here. Get this, okay? There's the hard soil, the shallow soil, the weed-infested soil. That's the negative side of the soil picture. And then there's the good soil that breaks down into three parts, 30-fold, 60, and 100-fold. That's six conditions of soil. In other words, the good soil has good soil, it has better soil, and then it has the best soil. And the question that you must ask as a disciple is, what kind of soil do I want to be in? Because I'm the one that will go to the soil. The sower is providing the word of God. The soil is there. It's waiting to be for your seed to come and for you to grow and grow and grow from 30 to 60 to 100. But the truth is that some of us are not quite there. Now, I was going to ask Harry to build a staircase, a stairway here on the stage for this illustration so that all of you would understand what I'm talking about. Can you imagine a staircase coming from the top there down to here? and gradiated with a hundred steps. Can you see that? 30, there's a little platform right here. It's made out of mahogany, by the way. Can you see it? There's a platform for the 30-fold. There's another platform for the 60. And then at the very top, there's a hundred-fold. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. So the challenge for Harry when he was going to build a staircase that he never got around to, he has to start from heaven and work to earth because that's the way Jesus did, you see. All right, so we gradiated. Step one, step two, step 30, step 60, step 100. All gradiated. Everyone in this room is somewhere. But let's just assume that all of us are at the 30 stage. It's step 30. We're all there together, okay? And it's yours to grow or to go down. Because tomorrow you might be a 31. But by Wednesday you might be a 25. You know how life does that to our faith. You know, some days we have giant faith. Other days we don't. Some days we are fully devoted followers and nothing can stop us, not even Goliath. Then another day comes along and just a the most puny thing that comes along gets you right off the track and you roll all the way down to one. Are you listening? Are you getting me? Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. So what I did when I came up with this teaching of six conditions of soil, I decided to check it out and my wife and I went on a trip back to Kentucky where I went to school, Asbury Theological Seminary. 200,000 volumes in this library, one of the largest theological libraries in the United States, maybe the largest, actually. And it was in the summer, the students were gone. I came in, had the whole library to myself, and I spent the whole day trying to find some teacher in the history of the church that taught six conditions of the soil. And I looked, and I looked, and lunch passed, and I looked some more, and, I, and then finally, surprisingly, one name rose to the top. One name uh, that is very famous in the theological world, he was known as the fat ox. Does anyone know who the fat ox was? Well, there was a guy in the first service that knew who the fat ox was. Uh, that's Father Tony. Okay? Ordained Catholic priest that attends the church, which is pretty cool, really, to have an ordained Catholic here. A father. And he said, oh yeah, that's Thomas Aquinas. Okay, and Thomas Aquinas, when you talk about, in the Catholic Church, when they talk about the doctors of the church, Thomas Aquinas is the big dog. I mean, literally, he was huge. One time, uh, a soldier walked up to him and said, you're nothing but a fat slob. When I look at you, all I see is fat. And then Aquinas said to him, all I see when I look at you is God. That's the kind of guy he was. <laughs> so Thomas Aquinas taught six conditions of the soil, but somehow it got lost. So I'm trying to bring it back now. Are you with me? 30, 60, and 100 fold. But I got to tell you, this is not a very American idea because in America, we're all equal, right? We've got equal access. We got equal, uh, we got equal participation. Uh, we, we, we are all about equal protection under the law. 
all of those equalities. We're all about equality, and we like the idea that all the disciples are on the same level all the time. And the truth is, there's a big difference between a 30-fold Christian and a 60-fold Christian. Big difference, okay? Now, we're 30-fold Christians. You want, you want an example of a 60-fold Christian? I have some friends. Their name are Ken and Don, okay? They got saved like in their 30s. They were both rocket scientists, okay? They worked in Albuquerque, physicists. And they got saved. And they got gloriously converted. And they decided that they wanted to serve God with all their hearts. So they quit their jobs as physicists and started working down at the church, okay? Every retreat, every Bible study, every prayer time, anything that they could do to enhance their own personal discipleship, they did. And they grew and they grew and they grew. And they went on retreats. They went on a missions trip. That missions trip awakened them. And then they realized that God was calling them to the mission field. So what did they do? They'd only been Christians for about five years at this point. And somebody said, well, there's an opportunity in a country in Europe that you could go to. What's the name of the country? Albania. What do you know about Albania? You know it's a communist country, right? And it's also an Islamic country. And so Don and Ken and their two kids went to Tirana, the capital of Albania, one of the most dangerous places for Christians in the world. And they started doing their ministry. By the way, their youngest boy got himself beat up like on day one. It was hard. But they were determined to stick to the mission, and nothing was going to deter them. And so they wanted to expand their, expand their ministry, and they were having trouble with housing. So they went to the Islamic overlord of the central district of Tirana. And they said, look, we're Christians but we want to share the love of Jesus with the people. Would you support us? And the overlord said, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, two Americans come into an overlord of the Islamic neighborhood in, in, uh, in Tirana, and you know, it sounds like a bar joke, doesn't it? <laughs> and he says, okay. And then he says, I've got a house for you. It's got one problem. It's suspended above the open sewer, and you can live there with my blessing. So they moved in, and they've lived there for 10 years above the sewer. They just got housing away from the sewer. They could finally exhale and take a breath. But my point in sharing this with you is that if you want to talk about 60-fold Christians, Ken and, Ken and Don are 60-fold Christians, and they're not coming home. They made their commitment. They're going to stick with it. Every once in a while they come home to, and not for good, they just drop in basically, and we are blessed by their presence. But these people are such serious Christians. You know, I feel like I can't even untie their, their sandals. You know what I mean? They are so into it and so devoted. That's what a 60-fold Christian is. Now, I want to tell you, there are 60-fold Christians in the making here at C3. There are people that are going to rise up to that kind of level of Christianity. And they don't need any participation trophy. You know how that is. You know, the Little League. You know, if you show up, you get the participation trophy. It's as, as big as the, the player of the year has got a plastic statue this big. And the participation trophy is this as big because we don't want, to feel, want them to feel like they've been uh, overlooked or whatever. You know, Thelma came to me one day. And we built a gymnasium up in up in Sacramento and uh, at a church. We also used it for our services. And she said, let's start a basketball league. So we started a basketball league in our church. So all through the week, all these teams are playing in our sanctuary. And the parents came to me and said, you know, we don't really want our kids to, uh, we don't want you to keep score. The kids knew exactly what the score was. We had bought a thousand dollar scoreboard to put on the wall. We weren't using it. It was Take, kick, kicking off the time, but it wasn't given the score. But if you asked any one of the kids on, that was playing, oh yeah, it's 12 to 6. 
<laughs> they knew exactly. Because you can't take that competitive spirit out. And I don't care what Dr. Spock taught in 1946 about you know, children's esteem. These parents were insisting that we not keep score, but they were keeping score anyway. Finally, the parents capitulated we could keep score because they knew <laughs> that's what it's about. We're not here to cooperate. We're here to beat the other team. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of another lesson about the participation trophy that comes to me. You know, I think a lot of people come to church and they, ah, you know, I spent an hour in church this week. I should get a participation trophy. Not until you're suspended over an open sewer should you get a participation trophy. That's 60-fold Christianity. Now, here's how it breaks down. When you're a 30-fold Christian, you're getting your life together for the Lord. You love the Lord. You tithe. You attend. You serve. You're doing everything that normal American Christianity is about. But it's going to take more to go up the staircase here. It's going to take more. And uh, you know what? When I had uh, young men coming through my church, young women as well, training for the ministry, I was telling them, you know, you're going to have to be more than what you are when you were a lay person. You're going to go into the ministry. Start training yourself for that because it's going to take more than just average Christianity here. It's going to take something greater than that. And, you know, I'm happy to say that many of them rose to the occasion. And they basically, the cross before them, the world behind them. They just went for it. And that's really what we are called to, too, because the times are dire, my friends. 2021 is going to be a challenge for Christianity. Religious freedom is under assault like it never has been in the United States. There might be restrictions ahead on our worship. Well, there already is restrictions, aren't there? You know, so it's going to take a different kind of breed of Christian to get through this next season for God's glory. So what we have to do is we have to cultivate our seed bed. Remember the sower's casting, and it was lavish. You know, the way that the sower was, every, the seed went everywhere it could. And some of it has fallen on you. And now your job is to make sure that the seed bed is well cultivated. You're cultivating faithfulness like Psalm 37 says to do. If there's weeds, you pull them out. If it's shallow, you deepen it. If it's hard, you soften it. Whatever you can do to make yourself more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and more full of the Holy Spirit, you do it. And that could mean getting a mentor. That could mean going on a spiritual retreat, going on a solitude retreat, a silence retreat. Who knows what kind of thing you could find. But whatever you can do to enhance your own Christian walk, you should do it. And you know what it'll mean? It'll probably mean that about 10% of the church will be moving on to other ministries which is what we want, isn't it? You know? Expanding the kingdom of God, that's the point. Because the church is in the business of making saints. So 30-fold is getting your act together. 60-fold is giving your life away. That's what Ken and Don are doing. They're giving their lives away for the Albanian people because they were called to do that. What's 100-fold? Greater love hath no man then he lay his life down for who? Friends! That's not the greatest love. That's the greater love. You know what the greatest love is? When you lay your life down for your enemies. That's hundredfold. Who's done that? Well, I can think of a few, but the one that comes to mind is Jesus Christ himself. He was put on the cross by wicked men. And he laid his life down for his enemies. And what did he say there at the close? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's way up there. <laughs> the platform up there. Can a human being actually reach that? Well, he did. He was fully human. And when you think about Stephen, what did he say as they were stoning him? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was the same thing. You know? Now, I don't know if anyone in this church will ever have to lay their life down for their enemies. But that's what 100-fold Christianity is. Now, just to wrap this segment of what I'm doing this morning up, I want to share with you three women as examples of what, what this is all about. Now, I could share with you three men. I'll tell you who the three men I could share with you. Uh, Harvey Weinstein would be one. 
You've heard of him, right? A second one would be Prince Harry. A third would be Billy Graham. Now you say, that, that's blasphemy. You mentioned Billy Graham in the same voice as Harvey Weinstein? It turns out that Harvey Weinstein had raw energy, and so did Prince Harry have raw energy, and so did Billy Graham have raw energy. It was what they did with their raw human energy. So with the three women I'd like to share with you is Janis Joplin. Have you heard of her? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're my age, you've definitely heard of Janis Joplin. Second one would be Lady Diane, uh, uh, Diana, and the third one would be Mother Teresa. So let's talk about Janis Joplin. All right. Now, a lot of people think that Janis Joplin was from San Francisco, which is my hometown. She wasn't from there. She became known to the world through rock bands in San Francisco. And I didn't know her personally. I never met her but I had friends that had met her. And let me tell you what they said about her. Every one of them said the same thing. She's scary. <laughs> the Grateful Dead. We don't like partying with Janice, she's scary. The Grateful Dead, the ones that travel with 40 tons of rock and roll equipment across the country with an equal amount of drugs in the second trailer. And they thought Janice Joplin was scary because she wanted everything all the time she wanted every experience. She wanted to embrace the world 24-7, 365, without stop. And she had nothing but raw energy, and she wanted everything, and she went with it. And she died at age 27. By the way, can you think of some other rock stars that went down at 27? Got a guy named Jimi Hendrix? Same attitude. Tremendous energy. Tremendous skill. Dies at 27. Jim Morrison of The Doors dies at 27. Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones dies at 27. And on and on and on, the 27 Club grows. Still growing to this day. Because people have energy and they don't know what to do with it, so they try to embrace the entire universe in one swell swoop and they die in the attempt. Now Lady Di, well before I get to that, let me tell you a little side story. You got time for that? Okay, uh, in September of 2017, Hurricane Harvey, well, it was actually in late August that Hurricane Harvey hit Port Arthur, Texas. Okay? Now, I mention that because Janis Joplin was born in Port Arthur. So, two guys, sometimes one of them comes to the church once in a while, that would be John Minnick. We jumped in the car, and we went down to Port Arthur to help uh, deal with the flooding, because the lower part of Port Arthur was completely flooded, and all the houses down by the water were flooded up to their ceilings, and the drywall had to be removed from the houses so that they could dry out, so that they could re-drywall and re-establish the houses. There was a little church down there. And when we got there, the, the, the bosses of the jobs said, uh, you guys can sleep in this church here. We've already gotten the drywall out of there, so it's just empty and it's got studs. So we got cots for you, you'll sleep in there. Okay, so we, we camped in the, in the place. And interestingly enough, the, the electricity was out, and I was checking it with my flashlight, going through this cavernous church, and the studs were all bare. And I saw a picture that was hanging. It had just recently been rehung. And it was a picture of the choir of the church back in the late 50s. And there was a circle drawn around a face in the choir. And it said, Janis Joplin, age 10. I was in Janice Joplin's home church. She was raised as a Christian believer. But she couldn't contain her own energy, and it just went sideways. You know what? A disciple is someone that can contain the energy and focus it on the things of the Lord. So Lady Diana, here she comes. What a beautiful woman. The most photographed woman on earth. And, you know, it was a mixed bag with her. You remember half the time she was doing charitable work, she was a member in good standing with the Anglican Church all the way to her death. She never renounced her faith. She was a believing Christian. But she had a little trouble with her raw energy. Sometimes it was in charity, and then over here she's partying with the shakes, right? Over here. She was two things. She was conflicted. Isn't that the way a lot of people are? You know, trying to be a saint and a sinner, and equally committed to both, and what does it do? It tears you apart. 
The third woman I want to share with you about, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Now, you know, it's St. Teresa now, officially. She has been canonized. It was one of the fastest canonizations of a saint in the history of the Catholic Church. Undoubted that she is a saint. And what kind of a woman was she? She was a woman of raw energy. And when you listen to people that are interviewed that knew Mother Teresa, they said one thing about her. She never stopped. She was always going, 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 because discipleship is always in motion. And her energy was, was the same kind of energy that was in Janis Joplin and Lady Di and Harvey Weinstein and all the others, except she had learned and had gained the power to push that energy down to one thing. One thing and one thing owner. What is a saint? A saint is someone that does only one thing and that is love God with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. That's what a saint is. Okay, Mother Teresa achieved that. By the way, they gave uh, Mother Teresa a doctorate, an honorary doctorate at Yale. They had somebody else they were going to give an honorary doctorate that year. So she went to Yale. And when she went on the podium, the place was packed with people, and they got, gave polite applause. And she told them that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. She basically preached the gospel to the intellectuals of Yale. And she left the stage, and now they're given the second honorary doctorate to Meryl Streep. And the audience went crazy. Meryl Streep, can you believe it? Meryl Streep is getting a doctorate from Yale. What an amazing thing. Mother Teresa had saved thousands of people in the house of death in Calcutta, had comforted you know, all these people, started the... The, the uh, Sisters of Charity, and here comes Meryl Tre Streep, and she gets the standing ovation. The world does not recognize holiness. You get that? Now, you're a holy people. Let the world recognize that. Be it. I'll tell you this. Mother Teresa, in her diary, records her encounter. Three times she had a visitation from Jesus Christ himself in 1946 and 1947. And he gave her the vision of establishing the Sisters of Charity, which is his, the organization that, that she established. And uh, the thing about it was Jesus showed up and her heart was filled with immaculate joy and never spoke again for the rest of her life. And so she was, you know, the, the experts were saying she was depressed. How did she deal with her depression? Work, work, work. And that's how she dealt with it. Now all this to say that you and I are called to greater discipleship. It's up to you to determine where you're going to fall on this. Now if you look at the sheet, I know it's kind of goofy, but it says the human dashboard. And below the human dashboard, you see six gauges. And these gauges are trying to determine the level of, of fullness, let's say it. And uh, the first one, if you look to the left there, is IQ, or the development of the mind, IQ. I already put you at above average intelligence. I already marked that in, okay? That's the good news about C3. We're all above average intelligence. It's kind of like Lake Wobegon where the children are all above average. You guys aren't getting this, are you? <laughs> okay, so I'll pass on that one. Let's go to the MQ. Your MQ is guided by a gift that God gave you called the conscience. Does anybody have a conscience here? Okay, about six of you, good. That is a, a gift from God that the conscience will indicate when you've stepped on the wrong side of the fence. And, uh, you know, the conscience can be a real pain, <laughs> but it's essential. And the disciple is learning to listen to the conscience because the conscience and the Holy Spirit often align. The conscience can be wrong, though, and that's where false guilt comes in. That's a whole other sermon. But moral conscience, that is so important for the disciple to decipher where you are. Are you full of a healthy conscience? That's a good thing. Let's go to the third one. 
EQ, emotional quotient. Now, there's been books written about emotional quotient. I have a friend that did his dissertation and doctorate uh, on EQ. And that's the heart and what you're passionate about. And, but sometimes our emotions get away from us. You know, personally, I'll give you a clue about myself. Uh, I have an anger problem. And, and so I don't score myself very, very full here because every once in a while I just get torqued off. Okay? Like I'm in Sedona and there's a roundabout. <laughs> and some guy with a license plate that says Iowa that doesn't understand what a yield sign is. I'm learning to get a little bit of control there. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to give me the fruit of patience and, uh, and to expand me personally on that. Now, you may have perfectly balanced emotion. But then again, there might be some areas where, for example, the emotion of fear can dog you, especially in deciding. I don't know if I can do this. I'm afraid. You need to take the step. Then uh, PQ, the body, physical quotient. Some of you are real specimens. I'm not going to tell you what side of the specimen table you're on. <laughs> but some of you are real beasts and you really work on your body, and that's good because it is your means of conveyance on this earth. And it's important for the disciple to take good care of the body because the disciple is going to go out and be using that channeled energy. That one thing requires you to travel. You've got to be able to move. And so the physical has to be handled. So you go to the gym to get the balance that you need to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Then you've got the soul, which is about the spiritual quotient. This is really, I'd rather you say spirituality for the S. Because spirituality is the way that the Christian deals with what the Holy Spirit and what Jesus is saying to you. And also, your response to the Word of God. That's all there too. So your spirituality. Actually, the whole house is a spiritual house. You're a spiritual being having a human experience, not a human being having a spiritual experience. Eventually, uh, eventually the humanity kind of has to bow to the spirituality, especially after you die. But we're made for eternity, aren't we? That's good news. And then finally, uh, the will quotient. Okay, I was going to put volition there, the volitional quotient. I took it out and said the will. Your will has everything to do with your discipline. And it takes discipline to be a disciple. So I want you to put this on your refrigerator. And I want you to fill in where you are. Are you empty or are you full? Or are you somewhere in between? I guess you'd be probably in between. But put it there and measure yourself to see how your discipleship is coming along. And there you will get your spirituality screenshot. All right. Now, let me just review. A 30-fold Christian is someone that's gotten their Christian life together. You know your doctrine. You know how to do evangelism. You serve the church. You serve the community. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're getting your life together. A 60-fold Christian up there is someone that's giving their life away, okay? Not counting the cost, not, you know, not bearing somebody else's cross and then sending a bill for the carrying fee. <laughs> and then a hundredfold is someone that gives their life away even for their enemies. So where are you? Are you ready to start the stairway? By the way, the whole stairway, it's Jesus himself. He's making himself available.